Welcome back. We are talking about section 5.5, additional applications of integration to business and economics. In the previous video, we tackled the future and present value of an income stream or income flow. Uh, we're going to try to work on consumer willingness this time and also consumer surplus. So let's see if we can get to the right spot. Okay, so first definition is um, consumer willingness to spend. And, I, you know, I don't know, this is a definition that kind of makes it sound like it is. So if we're looking at a demand curve, and so remember that this generally tells us the, the frontier at which a consumer would be willing to buy something. So we're measuring price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. This is common with economics, not as common in math. Um, you know, you might think of price generally being the independent variable and belonging on the horizontal axis, but it tends to make integration uh, easier if Q is down here and P is up there. So we're going to go with that, that convention. So the willingness to spend WS or CWS um, is basically saying, look, if this is the highest price that a consumer is willing to pay at any given amount of demand, so this is actually the entire market's willingness to, to pay then if you're willing to, uh, you know, if you're only uh, going to sell, say, 10 4K TVs, then the price that you can charge is pretty high because you can find a few consumers who are willing to charge, uh, are willing to pay that. If you only want to sell 10 and you charge less than that, it should be easy to find people who are willing to pay less money and all the way down to, you know, sure, I'll take a free 4K TV. Um, so if, you, we, if we fix a quantity that we want the market to, to sell, consumer willingness to spend is essentially the area underneath the demand curve up to that quantity. So it is precisely this shaded region. And uh, it, it's a quantity because if you take dollars per unit and you multiply by units, you get to, uh, dollars. So this is the, the dollar value of what consumers are willing to buy. So we'll, we'll do a combo uh, of that in, you know, along with this new topic here in just a sec. So here's our second definition here, consumers surplus. And so basically the idea with this is that if you take the consumer willingness to spend, that's great, but if you actually look at the market, nobody is selling 70 inch 4K TVs for 20 bucks. So what you also have to compare is uh, if, if you're at a particular market value, so if this is the quantity you want to sell, here is where you would imagine that price being leveled out at. So all of this is basically just kind of pipe dream. It's stuff that consumers would certainly be happy to pay for because the prices are way lower, but that's not what the market is actually at. So if the market is at, sitting at this price for 70 inch 4K TVs, uh, that sounds fine, but remember, the demand curve is showing you what consumers are willing to buy anyway. So if this is where the market's at, anything between the actual price and what consumers are willing to pay is kind of gravy. It, it's things that they think of as getting a deal, essentially. Because if, if I'm the consumer who's at this point on the demand curve, any of these prices between P0 and my height seem good to me. I'm willing to pay $1,200. I see a price of $800. That's going to feel like savings. So this idea of consumer surplus is kind of psychological, but it's the notion that consumers are seeing a price that's lower than what they were willing, and that feels good, essentially. So what we start with is the willingness to spend, the entire area underneath the, um, the demand curve, willingness to spend, but then subtracting out the, this little rectangle down below, um, because that's, those aren't realistic prices anyway. So let's try it with an example. So we'll stick fairly generic. We'll just say, oh, it's a product. Um, so we'll say it has a demand curve that looks like D of Q equals root 1600 minus Q. This is in dollars per item when Q items are sold. Um, and then let's look at the supply side of this as well so we can bring back a topic we haven't talked about for a little bit, which is market equilibrium. So here's our supply curve. It's much nicer, it's just a line, but uh, the two questions we are in charge of answering are, what is consumer willingness to spend? And what is the consumer's surplus? Both measured at market equilibrium. So the first thing we have to remember is what market equilibrium is. 
but you might recall that's where demand and supply functions are equal. So it's the quantity where you get uh, equal pricing from the supply and demand sides. So we set the two uh, equations, two expressions equal to each other. So we've got demand equals supply. Uh, we can square both sides to try to get rid of that radical. That's a typical strategy for solving radical equations. And then once we distribute stuff out, we, we notice we definitely still have a square in there. Uh, factoring does not look like it would be fun, but we can use quadratic formula or Wolfram Alpha or Maple or whatever it is you're using, uh, graphing calculator too, um, to get a couple of surprisingly nice solutions. Uh, you know, you might not be expecting whole numbers there, but pleasant surprise. So there's two solutions ostensibly, but of course, since we're talking about real things, negative 12,800 units doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, so we'll stick with the positive one and say, okay, here is our one solution that is actually meaningful to us. Um, if, you're, if you're feeling mathematically adventurous, you could also take this and plug it back into the original equation, and you'll notice that it actually is an extraneous solution. So not only does it not make sense in context, it actually isn't a solution to the re original equation anyway. Okay, so our first task was consumer willingness to spend. We have determined that it's 1,200 units where market equilibrium is going to happen. So that willingness to spend looks like just the area underneath the demand curve. So the integral of d of q, the q naught is our cutoff point. Here's our demand function we were actually handed. Uh, I'm going to do a little substitution because the square root is a little more complicated than we're comfortable with. But that just means that we're taking 1600 minus q and replacing uh, the, under, the, the underside of that radical with uh, u. And then you'll notice that the differential pieces, dq, since the derivative of this would just be negative 1, dq can be replaced with negative du. So pretty, pretty smooth transition there, just an extra negative sign. And then we're pretty good at square rooting stuff, or rather taking the integrals of square rooting stuff. We're also probably good at square rooting things. Uh, so just remember that this was uh, u to the 1 half. So when uh, the power goes up by 1, it's going to go up to 3 halves. We divide by that new power. So dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. And then we had that negative factor from the differential substitution too. I'm still reminding myself because this is in we're in u territory right now. I'm still reminding myself that it's actually q values that eventually we want to plug in. So I don't want to I, I don't want to accidentally plug in 1200 for u because that's not really what's going on here. Since the integral stuff is done, we can do, get rid of our substitution stuff and go back from u's to q's. Uh, and then at that point, I don't really need to remind myself because there, these really are q's. There's no ambiguity. So we plug in our 1200, we plug in our zero, and we get approximately 37,000 and change. So this, I think, was in dollars because we just had dollars per unit and, and number of units sold. Um, so this consumer willingness to spend says, uh, if the demand side of this had its way, if the producers were willing to sell at any price that consumers were willing to buy it, we could sell 1200 units of this for a total of $37,000. But that's gonna include people who are willing to buy, you know, whatever it is, our, our 4K TV for, you know, dirt cheap. So making it a little more realistic, we'll consider the consumer surplus side of this. I realize this is still, you know, fairly contrived, but we're trying to get used to what's going on here. So consumer surplus is the thing we just figured out minus the actual uh, amount. Um, so we've got, uh, the integral that we just did, which is going to look very familiar, minus basically the, the product of uh, price and quantity at this equilibrium point. Okay, well, we have one challenge, which is that we know what Q0 is. We, we already are familiar with the uh, quantity that is sold at equilibrium, but we actually don't have this just yet. Um, but that's okay, we can go back to it. So remember, we're at equilibrium, that's not always the case. Sometimes they will tell you just here is a Q naught to work with, and we'll have to know whether we're working in the supply or the demand side of things. But since we're working at market equilibrium, basically all we need to know is uh, if Q was 1200, what is P? And since it's equilibrium, we could go to either the demand or the supply side of this to get an answer. So we're gonna look at demand just because, you know, why not? And uh, if we plug in 1200 to our demand formula, we get 20. Um, so what that means is uh, we just figured out here is 
naught. This is the price at which our product would be sold. So uh, we already did the integral, so we'll just snag that 30, 37,000 that we did before. Again, this is just willingness to spend. Here is P naught, here is Q naught. So our consumer surplus is pretty easy in this case since we've already done the willingness to spend side of it. So we dump in 13,000 and, uh, sorry, we dump in, we dump in our 37,000. We take off the, the amount uh, underneath the market equilibrium price since that's not stuff that's gonna get spent anyway. And we come up with a smaller 13,000. So this is still perceived savings by the demand side, by the consumers, because they were willing to pay some higher price up at that demand curve, um, but they got some price lower than that, somewhere between the demand curve and the market equilibrium price. Um, so that's all perceived savings from the perspective of the consumer. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just, <laughs> it, it isn't really excess money, right? But it's, it's the idea that I was willing to pay some amount and I didn't have to pay that full amount. So it feels like savings. Okay, so we'll be back in the next video with some discussion of the, the surprise.